Go ahead and say your name and spell it for me. Okay, um, Denizulu Giantini, D-I-N-I-Z-U-L-U, G-E-N-E-T-I-N-N-I-E. What is, what is your occupation? What, are, what do you do? Um, I wear many hats, a uh, visual artist, uh, writer, researcher, um, uh, co-director of the Dos Amigos Fair Rosamond Slave Ship Replica Project. Okay. Tell me a little bit about the uh, Henrietta Marie, the history of it. Um, Henrietta Marie, uh, you, 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 of course you'll get the, 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 the full story uh, when you actually visit the Mel Fisher Museum. Uh, but in brief, English slave ship, uh, she sank in 1700 or 1701, I think we're now thinking closer to 1700, uh, after having delivered a, what they would call cargo, of Africans to Jamaica. Um, in the homeward passage to England, apparently they decided to go around the western tip of Cuba rather than go through the windward passage between Cuba and Haiti. I think there was a risk of encountering the French Navy. And uh, coming through the Florida Straits, that ended up being their undoing. Uh, in a storm, the uh, 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 Henrietta Marie uh, wrecked on a reef, a place called New Ground Reef, uh, only 26 feet of water. Uh, we can almost imagine the drama. Um, uh, can you imagine? on a sailing ship, you're in a storm, mountainous waves, and you know, you're trying the best to keep your ship perpendicular, and then you come down the, you know, the, once you get to the peak of the wave and you come down that side and then just to see an exposed reef and know that you're not gonna see London again. Uh, that, that's, that's uh, um, you know, the, uh, the kind of drama it was. It turns out that the Henrietta Marie was the first slave ship uh, to be found and seriously studied in North American waters, uh, which is to say that there were others that may have been found, notably one uh, that's known as the Ivory Wreck in Key Largo that was found some years uh, previously. Um, an, uh, an Ivory Tusk was found, which, uh, as in the case of the Henrietta, Henrietta Marie, was the giveaway that, oh, this ship had been to Africa, and if it had been to Africa, therefore we know. And uh, it turns out that the, um, the wreck, as, 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 uh, although there was very little of it, um, and uh, the archaeologist Corey Malcolm David Moore, uh, who did most of the work um, uh, in Key West, uh, they were able to pretty much reconstruct what happened where the, 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 the uh, aft part of the heel lodged on that uh, that reef, and then the waves just tore the rest of the ship apart, and so you had this scatter pattern. And in it, you found everything from trade items, uh, beads, uh, um, uh, African artifacts, uh, and then, of course, the most notable, most compelling of all the artifacts, the iron shackles. Uh, some of them uh, small enough for children, and, uh, and uh, I can tell you, uh, you know, I'm supposed to be a big tough guy from New York, but um, yeah, the sight of that, it, 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 it can really affect you, you know. So do we know if any, any of the enslaved uh, Africans uh, perished at the wreck? N none. They had all, uh, there were no Africans aboard. They had all been delivered to Jamaica. Uh, there may have been, uh, <clears throat> and uh, the uh, I mentioned Corey Malcolm and, and, and David Moore, who did, who did um, uh, extraordinary archaeological work. Um, uh, would would know more about this. Uh, she may have delivered some Africans to Barbados previously, and then to Jamaica, but. Um, Yeah, so um, it, it's possible that the ship had uh, uh, delivered Africans to Barbados prior to Jamaica, um, but uh, she was uh, laden with just the homeward voyage of um, uh, homeward cargo of uh, dye wood and, and uh, uh, I guess you could say uh, uh, the products of enslaved labor. Uh, what's significant about the Henrietta Marie is that the, the date 
right at 1700. Now, the 1700s would turn out to be the, de the, the century when the largest amount of Africans were brought across, uh, and mostly by British ships, because the British government had succeeded in getting this very lucrative contract called the Asiento that was kind of uh, engineered by the Pope with the Spanish government. So they were going to s supply the Spanish colonies and so forth. Um, when this whole business started, of course, as with anything else in those days, it was treated as a royal monopoly. Uh, any money that's made, you bring it to the crown and we'll figure out where it goes from there. And um, around the, the, the uh, well, as much as that may have worked more or less for the crown, it was not very efficient. So they were beginning to be private traders. This was kind of a, an experiment in bourgeois capitalism, if you will. And so the Henrietta, Henrietta Marie was one of the first of those private traders, which would end up being the model for the, uh, the 1700s. So the, in, in that way, the, the, the wreck is significant, as well as, a, as I mentioned earlier, the um, fact that this was the first ship to be found in North American waters, because as uh, horrific as slavery was, and everything that we know about slavery as Americans from our historic experience, we're very much sobered by the fact that, uh, what is it, 5% of the Africans who were brought across the Atlantic came to North America. So the Caribbean, Brazil, uh, 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 South and Central America uh, received many more millions and many more millions perished in that, in that voyage going there than what we had come here. So it's just, a, a, just an, another you know, uh, sobering um, reflection that, that, that uh, the discovery of this wreck kind of provides us with the opportunity to do. Okay. Talk a little bit about, uh, I think it's the Dos Amigos 3D project. Talk to me a little bit about that project. Uh, uh, the Dos Amigos. Um, okay, I, I guess I'll start on a personal note. When I relocated to Miami in 1974, um, getting to know the place, I was living in South Miami, there was this great bookstore called Modern Books, uh, Bookstore, and in the bookstore I discovered a book called, I saw this book, History of American Slaving, uh, Freudian Slip, History of American Sailing Ships, and, you know, my non-pathological paranoid mind of, you know, African-American, uh, so, oh, yeah, right. They, they'll have all the romance about all the ships and not even mention anything. And then to my surprise, there was a whole chapter on privateers and slavers. And this turned out to be the book by Howard Chappelle, who was the maritime curator at the Smithsonian for a n number of years. And essentially, his interest was almost from an engineering standpoint, if you will, tracing just the evolution of how... Uh, sailing ships uh, evolved, and this whole innovation that really came about here in America uh, in, into uh, the search for speed, and, and that in fact became uh, uh, the title of one of his other books. But looking at these line drawings, almost like blueprints all through the book, to turn the page and see these plans of an actual slave ship from uh, called the Dos Amigos, uh, she was from Havana, Cuba. Um, we would find out much later through a lot more research. Um, uh, Chappelle speculated that, well, we don't have the details of how she got captured, but we know it was from not, any, not from any lack of speed. And um, so we find out that she was captured in Cameroon, with, um, in the, right near the capital, in fact, with 567 Africans who had been hastily landed, you know, kind of like the drug dealers throwing the bales overboard and hoping that uh, there won't be any evidence. But uh, as, the, uh, as it turned out, the details of the treaty between the British and Spanish governments allowed for that, that particular circumstance where 
there was no evidence of Africans being aboard, but the British witnessed them being landed. And then, of course, going on board, witnessed all of the evidence, um, a lot of which isn't even pleasant to talk about, of, of people having been um, uh, uh, imprisoned on, on, on board. Uh, the ship is taken to Sierra Leone and for adjudication. Uh, the court there condemns the ship. Yes, you're busted, you're, you're a slaver, uh, you're guilty, you have to forfeit your ship. And what would happen is that uh, those ships would be auctioned off very cheaply. Uh, and in a very cynical kind of way, a lot of them would just be bought up by other slavers and go right back into the, in, into the business. Um, however, the Commodore of the Anti-Slave Trade Squadron at the time, Jonathan Hayes, um, he and his predecessor saw the wisdom of well, what if we, the Navy, buy these ships cheaply at auction and refit them to be um, pursuit vessels because these old frigates that we're sailing from the Napoleonic Wars are not catching up to these fast schooners and brigs coming out of Baltimore. And um, so the Dos Amigos gets refitted and renamed the Fair Rosamond and actually ends up capturing quite a few slavers, but really hardly a drop in the bucket compared to the, the, the scale of what was going on. So we end up having a, uh, a ship that has a story to tell on both sides of the law, uh, but m maybe most significantly, a ship from the era after uh, the legal slave trade was abolished by the British and, and also by the U.S. in 1807 and 1808. Uh, they st these were ships built specifically for the illegal, uh, quote-unquote, slave trade. We, you know, they weren't slaves and it wasn't trade, but, you know, that's the, uh, the term. And um, so we have a ship of that era of those that were specifically designed to be slave ships, uh, as opposed to in the 1700s when essentially these were regular merchant ships that once they got to the African coast would undergo a modification for the Middle Passage. Once they got to the uh, Caribbean or the Americas, they'd undergo another modification to haul the, the uh, uh, products that sugar, tobacco, dye wood, for example, as was the border, the American as was aboard the Henrietta Marie, um, and, you know, all, all of the, the, the bounty of slave labor. And, um, but these ships were designed to be illegal. Uh, I guess some people might draw a comparison with the cigarette racing yachts and the, today, like, okay, you got Coast Guard cutters and we got, you know, uh, this guy, these guys have to build something that can outrun a cutter and the Coast Guard has to have something that can, you know, very much the same, the same drama, and, and the same kind of profit motive involved. Um, it also meant that this whole trade was carried on to a greater extent by pirates and thugs and so forth, as opposed to, um, you know, legal merchant captains and, and, and so forth. Um, so having this interesting biography, as a case study of this illegal period, um, being uh, of the uh, specially designed slaver era, um, uh, that's two factors. And then the third one, and I think the most compelling, is that these design plans actually survived. I mean, when we think that there were tens of thousands of ships that made these crossings, and, and each one, I multiply that by how many voyages, um, and when we think that from the point of capture in Africa, in the village that was raided, to the point of disembarking somewhere in the Americas, for every one that survived, depending on what you read, anywhere from four to seven were lost, um, we start getting a, a, a sense of the, the, the scale of this. Um, but. Uh, so how do we tell this story? Uh, we can write, we can, it can be written in books. Uh, we can find illustrations, drawings, images. 
we can, with our best imagination, create uh, movies. But if we're able to, with the gift from history of these actual design plans, create a 3D full-scale replica. Uh, the value of replicas has been proven just by the number of them that are around, either restored ships like the Constitution and the Constellation, or, you know, the, the Viking ships, the Columbus ships, the, uh, the Jamestown ships. Um, having gone to Jamestown and, you know, being able to go aboard those vessels and say, you know, my God, people got on this in England to travel across the Atlantic. They, 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 they had to have been some serious desperation to get out of there, or the people in England wanted them out of there in the worst way, however you want to look at it. But to do for our ancestors what others have done in terms of bringing the history to life, and I think the most compelling part of that history is that, yes, we should not shy away from the horror story, you know, uh, let's not prettify it, let's not sanitize it any more than it needs to be, but the much more important story is the heroism, the, the strength, the mental, physical, spiritual strength by which people survived this. Um, those who did survive, um, by being able to tell the story of uh, what the conditions really were like on board. And, you know, we have lots of accounts from British observers of, um, I mean, you could be shackled to a person who died and the body is rotting next to you and, until, um, somebody gets ready to um, get the shackle off of you. Uh, uh, one of the little minor differences between the 1700s and the 1800s was that in the 1700s, we looked at those shackles that came out of the Henrietta Marie, they had a padlock on there. So once you got out to sea and there was no, you know, there was no land anywhere around, Captains and crews can feel a little more secure. They can unshackle these people, which makes it a little easier to move them around when you want them moved. Um, in the 19th century, they just riveted the shackle on because all of this was, um, it's illegal, it's hurry up, it's, you know. And so uh, there's no way that you can be unshackled from this, you know, decomposing body until, you know, uh, I guess they just cut the body loose and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. the, um, the Middle Passage is a chapter of history that, um, well, for, for, for sheer ugliness and barbarity, I, 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 I don't know if it could be surpassed by much. Uh, of course, there's slavery itself and then the lynching era after slavery, I mean, uh, all of which speaks to the kind of the same narrative that um, some human beings deem others to not be human enough to have, you know, the rights of being a man or a woman or a child or an elder. Um, and, you know, that psychosis just plays out in all the violence that we, you know, that we see. So the need for the story to be told by those who lived it, by those who were most affected by it. Um, I, uh, you know, without trying to be melodramatic or make, you know, light of the experience of people who are raped, I mean, that, we can actually say that America is a child conceived in this act of rape, and we're, we're like any such child, we're still wrestling with all the mental and other consequences of that. But in those situations, um, the story that matters is the person who had to survive the crime. Uh, the excuses of the person who perpetrated it, uh, well, okay, yeah, you, 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 maybe you're entitled to, your, to being heard, but 
Um, that's not the story that really affects and directs what we and future generations have to know. Um, so the, the need for the African story to be told is very much uh, with us. I think it's, uh, I won't even say I think because it's now being confirmed in so many ways. We're really in this time now of awakening that, uh, and interestingly enough, the native people who are from this land were the first to see this and predict this. Um, uh, five, ten years ago, we may not be, have been able to say this, but now, as the native people say, there are enough people on the planet who are awake. Now we can do things that we couldn't do before in terms of truth-telling. And we start seeing, I mean, the, 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 um, the unveiling of the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, otherwise known as the Lynching Memorial in Montgomery, I think it was, a, was and is a watershed moment in American history. Uh, the fact that, um, I mean, that got built and it's, it's, it's a very significant size memorial in a very significant location in the city of Montgomery that nobody vandalized, nobody prevented, nobody blocked, you know, because in spite of what we hear ginned up by the media and whoever else about how divided the country is, we can go back to 19, what was it, 77, 78, when the Roots episode, I mean, the national response to that just showed that there was, a, uh, there was and is this thirst in the country to know more about this. What was this? How did these people survive this? How would any one of us alive today, you know, uh, um, uh, survive it? And the Henrietta Marie bringing, coming back to that, when uh, um, I became aware of it, um, there was an article in American Visions magazine. It was a publication that kind of came out of the uh, Smithsonian, it was edited by Gary Puckrine. Excellent publication. I mean, every issue was just so much worth reading. And I believe it was the March 1986 issue that had an article by Ray Lane, a uh, journalist from Chicago, about a slave ship that was discovered in Key West. I'm saying, I'm right here in Miami. How did I not know about this? And uh, one of our artist friends, um, uh, Caleb Davis, who operated with his wife the Miami's only black-owned art gallery for a number of years, Gallery Antigua, um, he had, we had gone to the National Conference of Artists, that's our visual artists, African-American visual artists organization, venerable organization that had been founded in, 19, in 1959. When the, when the group gathered in Washington, Every, you know, we were all given copies of American Visions. I had not read mine, but he called me and said, have you seen this article? And when I saw it, I said, I hadn't. As soon as I read it, I said, well, I have, there's no excuse for me not going there and finding out what this is, uh, since I'm doing research on the Middle Passage. Um, I had a diver friend, uh, Howard Moss, who uh, I called him, and Cal Davis had also called him, and he found out about it. And I would find out later he beat me to it. He went down to um, Key West and did some shooting and created a kind of a documentary of his own. So my conversation with him prepared me well for when I went down and met with these guys at the Mel Fisher Museum. That was David Moore and Corey Malcolm, and they were so welcoming, they were so, um, um, I guess, encouraged by the fact that people had an interest in what they were doing, uh, a serious interest. And uh, so I would 
you know, we kind of established a relationship and, you know, I'd go down to Key West periodically and if I did, I would always make sure to go uh, meet up with them. And it was on one of those meetings when um, Corey had informed me that, oh, he came at a great time, you know, he just got some of the shackles out of the bath and, you know, I walked up the stairs, turned the corner, walked in the room and saw these, you know, little shackles and, um, you know, uh, you can say what you want about fragile ego and all that, but that's the only thing you have to hold on to. Well, I, I, I was glad I had that to hold on to, because it, was, it would have been very easy to just lose it. Um, but that's the, that's the, that tells us how compelling the story is. And um, the other side of that... Wait a minute, hold that thought yeah. for a second. Go ahead and stop and switch. switch. Yeah, I know. I've been. Okay, rolling. Yep. So tell me about the, the 3D. Okay. So the um, um, so having encountered these ship plans in a bookstore, and just realizing in that split second that we needed to do this, this this needed to be done, and for the same reason that the Mayflower was reproduced and all the rest, um, I began just doing research, and and it became kind of a, a what a, a a hobby, that's not the right word, but an avocation, an interest. The more I did, the more I started realizing that, no, this is not a play situation. This really does need to happen. I was very fortunate in 1992 to uh, encounter the National Trust for Historic Preservation had their annual preservation conference here in Miami. And at that conference, I ran into a brother named Harmon Carey. Harmon Carey from Wilmington, Delaware, uh, founder of the Delaware Afro-American Historical Society. At the time, he was a special assistant to the governor. Uh, he was well-connected, very knowledgeable, and he had the same interest. He didn't know what ship, but he had the idea that somewhere there needs to be a ship. So we became collaborators and partners on this and have been uh, pursuing it. Now, the most frequently asked questions... Um, is it built yet? No. Um, do we know where we're going to build it? Not yet. We've been... There are any number of possibilities. Uh, if all else fails, there's a, uh, a, a boat builder, a ship builder, who has a place in Maine who said, well, we could always do it in Maine. Um, once you get used to working year-round and, uh, you know, warm weather Maine can be a little daunting, but we do what we have to do. Um, we've uh, talked to the National Museum of African American History and Culture uh, about creating a maritime annex, which might still happen at some point. Uh, we initiated a conversation with the forthcoming International African American Museum in Charleston. Um, so we haven't had any uh, um, bites, so to speak, yet. Uh, one of our local county commissioners here in Miami-Dade envisions doing a black history museum in downtown Miami on the water, and he mentioned the idea of having something like a doorway of no return, a memorial. And so, well, now, here in Miami, there is no memorial to the Middle Passage, and the very spot that he's talking about, when the reproduction, not replica, of the Amistad came to Miami. Um, uh, she was docked right there, so it kind of shows that it can be done and, you know, what the logistics. So um, there are possibilities. So essentially the whole project consists of three branches of research. Um, researching the history of that particular ship and of the Middle Passage in general. Secondly, researching similar and related projects that we can learn from. And thirdly, just the logistics of where, when, how we can build this. The whole question of methods and materials. Um, do we build this the same way that it was built in the Baltimore shipyards, which is an interesting story in itself because those shipyards were so dependent on enslaved labor, both skilled and unskilled. Uh, the whole caulking trade was exclusively African-American, and they 
may, if we look, look at all the research, they may be correct, c credited with the first labor union movement. We're understanding that the value of what their labor is and that they control it, that they could negotiate for uh, better, better conditions. Frederick Douglass worked in one of those shipyards, so he, he, he gives us vivid accounts of, of, of that. Um, uh, and so the, the fact that a ship like the Dos Amigos was actually built by um, many African-American hands is, is certainly one of the, the ironies. Um, so uh, we are um, looking at, I, I think it's fair to say that today as we speak, in this kind of awakening moment when so much knowledge that had been hidden in darkness not that long ago is just rushing to the, you know, Africa town, I mean, and all, um, that there's a, a readiness now that, that, I, uh, um, that we can do. Now, uh, only this morning, I was reaching out to an artist uh, friend, associate of mine who uh, he worked with me on the artwork on the, for the Key West um, African Cemetery um, Memorial. Uh, he's helped me before doing 3D renderings, and it, I reached out to him and said, you know, while we're working on the means and methods and all, and where to get the resources to build this, we, might we be able to create something like a virtual model that can go around the world. Um, and what that would do, because it's, it's, it's just very important. Um, uh, we were conversing earlier about how resources like art collections just get stolen by, you know, I mean, just from the rightful owners. This is a project that really needs to be owned by us, by the people, by everybody. Um, my partner and I have deliberately shied away from kind of reaching out to the celebrities and the, you know, like this is the sensation of the week and, you know, it gets built and then it languishes somewhere. We really want this to be something that is um, uh, functional, that folks feel ownership of. Uh, I guess in the same way that people um, feel ownership of the, um, what? the Mayflower, if you will, or, or the USS Constitution, uh, a national treasure. Um, um, and in this case, I mean, this would be a, a global treasure. Um, here would be a traveling museum, an educational resource center, an ancestral memorial shrine that can come to your city if you're in any oceanfront or riverfront or waterfront location. Uh, it can come in this, the same way that ancestors would have seen this ship. A lot of those ships from the illegal era were very plain and unadorned, you know, nothing real pretty about them. Um, and while the ship is in port, there can be the programs, the activities that go on for the, that stay. And then as the ship leaves, we bring our offerings, and, our, and she's just totally beautiful, and we, she goes out and gives honor to all those who, we don't know their names, we don't know what they look like, but we know that their lives mattered. And this is our way of saying we, we remember. We, uh, you're not forgotten. Um, here, where we're sitting at Virginia Key Beach, we hold an annual ancestral remembrance our ceremony uh, in June. Uh, we do ours. We do at sunrise, um, and it's it's open to everybody. It's not limited in to any religion or ideology. Um, but that's the message: is that uh, you're remembered. You have a sacred place that's your home. Here's you know, uh, your life wasn't wasted in vain. We are now, we are stronger. We will be stronger. We will be better all the more because we have to make sure that your life was not, you know, in vain. 
So the, this is uh, part of telling the story okay. from our way. Okay. Take a break for just a second. Mm -hmm. Roland, Roland? Okay. Give me a short history. All right. So we're here at historic Virginia Key Beach Park. Uh, this has a very interesting history. It opened officially in 1945 as a Dade County Park for the exclusive use of Negroes. This was during the Jim Crow era. Everything was supposed to be separate but equal. Throughout the South, very rarely was anything uh, equal, even though everything was separate. Uh, this was quite an exception because the relationship between the black and white community was such that there was a level of respect. So that this beach ended up having uh, amenities that most segregated beaches would not have. Amusement rides, uh, um, the, uh, like, like a, we have a mini train and a, a, a merry-go-round. Uh, these elsewhere in the South would have been like the, just almost the hallmarks of, 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 of white parks. Um, it, it didn't all happen at once. Uh, before 1945, the same spot had been an unofficial African-American uh, recreation spot. You came out here by boat. There was nothing here, but it was a place you could come and... and, and um, the, the whole narrative of um, segregated black parks and what they did for people, uh, I believe the scholar... Um, uh, oh my goodness, uh, as much as I admire his work, he's uh, having a brain freeze, but his name is going to come to me shortly. Uh, he studied this and how restorative it was for people to come to these places on weekends and um, be among people who understand your life and you were rearmed to go back and deal with another week of, 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 of racism. Um, so uh, it, it evolved here, uh, bathhouse, um, the amusement rides, um, Amenities were very close to equal to those of uh, the White Park on Key Biscayne, which is across the water from us. Um, then by 1959, it was uh, folks, again, Miami was well ahead in the lead. I mean, I think 1945 was a full decade before Brown v. Board of Education and before the, the, the Civil Rights Movement. And so as early as 1959, people demonstrated at Key Biscayne and Crandon Park to desegregate the beaches, and that was done. Once it was de desegregated, the, the county thought they could close this one. Now we don't need two parks anymore. But this place was so beloved that folks, it, 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 it reopened. Um, it was closed down in 1982 when it transferred from county to city because the city claimed it cost too much to maintain. It lay dormant and fallow for 25 years or so, and uh, in the late 90s, there was a plan to just lease it out to developers, and the community got word of that, and the historic preservationists got word, and the public park activists got word, and the, uh, uh, the, the um, environmental community, environmental activists, and this really powerful coalition came together and said, no way. This park needs to be restored to what it was. Let it be a historic and environmental landmark that embodies, because this was during the time it was the hub of black life. It brought together all the neighborhoods, all the social classes from a, a wide radius. So a uh, very much beloved place. Um, when we started this effort, it was interesting that the New York Times and the San Francisco Chronicle picked up the story because, you know, what, here was a relic of segregation that people liked, that they wanted to restore, what's going on? But then when you find out, celebrities came here, Nat King Cole, Ella Fitzgerald, Billie Holiday, Martin Luther King Jr. himself came here. Um, so what we have is a real special spot, not to mention just the scenic beauty and the fact that you're here, you don't see tall buildings, and, um, and we walk in the footsteps of ancestors including Native American ancestors. I have to not leave that out because the earliest history of this place was a skirmish during the Seminole Wars.